Church and happy Easter. Good morning. Good morning. You could say happy Easter now. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. As we gather, we will be celebrating Holy Communion today. For those of you here, be sure that you have picked it up from the back of the church. Those at home, you have the opportunity if you choose to have juice and bread so that you can join in a part of communion wherever you are. We are going to begin with song. I invite you to remain seated for this song, Up From The Grave He Arose, 322.
for our responsive call to worship and our hymn of celebration when we sing the first four verses of Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Today is not like any other day. Today we slow down. Today we take it all in. Today we rest in the good news. This day is not like any other day. Today we are singing. Today we are full to the brim. Today joy cannot be contained. This day is not like any other day. Today the stone was rolled away. Today the women saw the empty grave. Today we know death does not win. This day is not like any other day. Alleluia. Amen. Verses 1 through 4. Exactly. 
exactly Jesus was alive again. You know, God did something wonderful and came to earth, the earth where we live. And his name was Jesus. And what Jesus did in this wonderful thing that God was doing was taught everybody about love. About how we're supposed to love one another, how we're supposed to help one another, how we're supposed to care for one another. And so we celebrate today because Jesus is still a part of our lives. There were people back in the time that he was here on earth that didn't understand. They didn't understand this new learning from God. And sadly, it did not go well. But guess what? Guess what? Guess what? Guess what? It got better. Because Jesus rose. And Jesus continued to teach until he completely went back to God. And he's still with us. Now, do you see him? No, we can't see him now, can we? But we can feel him. We have what's called the Holy Spirit. That's the Spirit of God that's in us and around us. And so we're so excited by that that we have Easter baskets, we have the money, we have flowers, we have fabric, we have a cross with white today. Because it's an exciting day to know that God's love is still with us every day, every moment, all the time. Should we pray about that? What an exciting day, Jesus. What an exciting day to realize that you are alive. Alive in our lives, alive in our spirits, alive in our hearts, alive in the flowers, alive in all things in the world. And the best news of all is that you love us. So today we celebrate with our families, we celebrate with our baskets and candy, we celebrate the good news that Jesus is alive. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. All right, I have to wait a minute before you go, before you go. Two fancy bags. Who wants the fancy? Me. You? <laughs> you want a fancy bag? <laughs> Is that okay with you? Yeah, as long as you get what's inside, right? All right. Well, you better take it back and show mom and dad, okay? is our responsive song reading for us today. Let us join together and join me in the bowl of prayer. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. 
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So family of faith, it is our tradition each week to have a prayer of confession. Not to harp on ourselves or to drum up our guilt, but because we believe that God is not done with us yet. So please join me in this prayer of confession because God is always listening and God's grace is always full to the brim. God of new life, we are a mixed bag. We want to be full to the brim with hope and joy, but often we overflow with comparison and doubt. We want to embody the resurrection, but often we'd rather stay the same than to begin again. We want to have the courage to be like the women on that Easter morning to run and speak truth. But often we are weary of courage and uncertain of our own voices. Forgive us for all the ways we remain unchanged, break into our hearts, overflow there with hope we pray. Amen. You have some time of silence for personal prayer. family of faith. There is life after death, then you can be certain. There is life after mess, there is life after mistakes. There is life after doubt. There is new life freely given, and that life is for you. You are forgiven, loved, and claimed. May we live full to the brim in response. Thanks be to God, and let it be so. Alleluia. Amen. Well, let us pray as we prepare to hear God's word today. Holy God, we so often long for more. We want more than the hamster wheel life of the to-do lists and errands, meal prep and alarm clocks. We want more than comparison and competition. We want more than certainty that drowns out curiosity. We want more than fear that leads to violence. We want a life that is teeming with alleluias. We want a life crowded with hope. We want a life congested with good news. We want a life jam-packed with forgiveness. We want a life bursting with laughter. We want a life so full that the stone just has to be rolled away. So today we pray, break the dam, dust the cobwebs from our ears, clear space in our minds to hear you clearly. Speak to us as only you can. It's what we long for. We long for you. Gratefully we pray. Amen. So our gospel lesson does come from the gospel of Luke, the events of this morning. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all of this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Johanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tape, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
we thought I have a moment to get my emotions back in check. I just that reaches into us, doesn't it? It just right into our soul. So there is an affirmation of faith in your printed materials. This time, I invite you to stand wherever you are as we share this responsibly. We believe in a God who can astound us. A God who created the mountains of Colorado, the stars on a summer night, and the green of Ireland. We believe in Jesus, whose example changes us. An example of love for those on the fringes, healing for the sick, and welcome for the lonely. We believe that Jesus was abandoned by his friends, wounded, mocked, and killed by the state. And in a garden, three days later, we believe that life began again. The stone was rolled back as death lost its sting. Ever since that day, we believe the Spirit has been inviting us into an expansive life. A life not measured by wealth or athletes, but a life full to the brim with joy, overflowing with laughter, saturated in hope, and decorated with good news. Death has lost its sting. We believe and are set free. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. Well, Mary Magdalene, Johanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women go to the tomb with the spices to tend Jesus' body. When they find the tomb empty, and they are stunned by the presence and words of the men in dazzling clothes, they then remember. They remember what Jesus has said, had said, and it compels them to go and tell the story. Even in utter shock, they return to their deepest knowing and allow themselves to receive this expansiveness of resurrection. Their imaginations and hearts expand and they take action in response. Many of the disciples won't open themselves to the expansiveness and initially rejected. Well, Peter is curious enough to return to the tomb, and as a result, he is filled with amazement and awe. You know, how do we carry forth what we have learned this Lent? We have spent time looking on the other side, looking beyond that all that troubles us, and yes, there is a lot. But to remind ourselves over and over again that in our lives there is still an asset, an aspect of being full to the brim. Can we be curious enough to return and remember? Can we allow ourselves to be filled with expansive hope? Can we trust in the expansive promise of new life and carry that promise with us wherever we go? Well, this morning we are concluding our series of Full to the Brim as we celebrate the truth of resurrection to new life, not only, not only at the end of our earthly life, but all the resurrections we experience daily in our day-to-day -day living. There's something important in the question of the angels of the tomb when we look and read all the gospel lessons about it. There is this idea of why are we looking for the living among the dead? Yes. You would expect the dead to be among the dead. But to expect Jesus there is not to have heard what he said. Not to believe what he shared. Not to believe what he promised. That he would be raised. Or to not believe in the end that it even could be the truth. 
Disappointment and trauma make us sometimes question everything we knew to be true previously. These three women are the first witnesses. Think about that journey. You know, we, we have talked and we've gone through Holy Week, what that was like for the people then, what that was like for those disciples what they had to watch, what they had to experience. And the women stayed for it all. They have spent their time in Sabbath, we can imagine agonizing, wondering what's next, feeling as if their hopes were dashed, and just grieving the loss of this friend and rabbi. So you can imagine as they're walking to the tomb, how they are feeling, how their souls, in many ways, carry this burden. And yet, they will do what they know is the right thing to do. Even when they could not go in fear for what they have seen and what has happened. Even though they might be fearful because there were soldiers that were to guard the tomb. And yet, they continue. And you can think as they are walking, as they're carrying these spices, that they're remembering, they're recalling all of these stories of the time that they spent with Jesus and how caring and loving for the ministry that he did and the words that he shared with them that brought to them a new understanding and appreciation of God in their ordinary lives. And then remembering the horror of what happened. The horror of seeing this one so gentle, so loving, teaching so much about the love of God to then be labeled an insurrectionist by the Roman authority and to have his life taken as an example to stop others from any type of insurrection. Jesus was their rabbi, their hope for Messiah. And as he was labeled as an insurrectionist and as he was crucified with other insurrectionists, he was labeled as one who threatened the power. These women were in hopes, dashed for now, of what could have been, or really, what should have been. When they find the stone rolled away and the tomb empty, they are stunned by this presence of men dressed in dazzling light and the words that are shared with them. Suddenly, for them, everything has changed. Jesus isn't there. You know, none of the gospel accounts tell the details of resurrection, but they all agree that women went to the tomb, expecting to anoint the dead body of Jesus. And each time, in each gospel, found he wasn't there. What they did last time, what they believed from the past, what they knew about things staying the same, suddenly did not apply. Instead, they meet these strange, angelic figures. The surprise of Easter is that Jesus isn't done with them. And Jesus isn't done with us. You know, new things scare us, don't they? Can you think back? Some with a more recent memory, some of us, we do have to go back a little further, about first day at school. Can you remember that even with excitement, there was anxiety? It was something new. What about the first day on a new job? You feel as if you've prepared and you've trained and then all of a sudden it's there. <coughs> and it's new. And it can be scary. All these firsts of life. These women were prepared to continue 
the burial of Jesus. They're not prepared for the dead to not remain dead. And now they must run and tell others. Telling that needs to continue even to this day. Who today needs to know that they are a beloved child of God? Who today needs to know that resurrection and new life is possible? No matter what your life is in that moment. It is resurrection that invites us to go and tell and to testify that Jesus is alive. They came to a tomb. They came to bury him. They're already grieving for him because they thought he was in the past. But he isn't. He's out there, already on the way, hoping they will follow him. And he's hoping the same thing about us. This living Jesus in the world always surprises us. Think of Peter. A few days, a few years later, speaking to the same sort of Roman official who ordered Jesus' crucifixion, saying this amazing thing, just a few years later, that God doesn't show any partiality. God doesn't love Methodists better than anyone else. God doesn't love Americans better than anyone else. God doesn't love the rich better than anyone else. And God, to be honest, doesn't love you better than anyone else. This is a new time in our world and in our lives. A new time to experience Easter. Every year, every new season of Easter comes to us in the truth of life. Whether pandemic, war, illness, personal crisis, Easter meets us in our realities, bringing hope and promise. What does Easter mean? Does it mean Easter baskets full of candy, colored eggs, lilies, special music in church, and a great service of celebration? Yes. Those are a part, have become a part of our lives through the generations. But Easter is so much more. And Easter is not one day. In our church here, it's a season in our lives. We are the people of the resurrection every day of our lives. And Easter does mean going to the tomb. It means being so scared because things have changed that even the Lord has to tell you, and only the Lord can tell you, don't be afraid. It means recognizing that this is a new time, and there is no going back. And sometimes we have to find new ways. It is much more than just getting along with the world as it is. We are called, like the women of this story, to get up and to get going. Jesus is not in the tomb in the past. Jesus is alive. And this is what he says to us over and over again. Don't be afraid. Get moving. If he could escape the tomb, so can you. If he can live again, get up. You're not done. You're not finished, but you're here to do what you thought. He has a new purpose and a different mission. Get up and go find him. Jesus is not done with us. Jesus is not done with you. We will find him where he said. In the eyes of the homeless, in the service of the hungry, I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. We will find you make, when we make the resurrection of those around us more important than our own customs. We will find him when we're more interested in following him than going our own way. We will find him when, as Paul says, we have the mind of Christ in our own mind. Then, and then indeed, Easter will come, not only for us, but from us that our church, our lives, will proclaim this good news, he is risen. For he will be risen, risen in us, and we will have found him. So however we find ourselves today, full of certainty or curiosity or confusion, we gather to celebrate and to explore and affirm the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ. Every year, 
we need to grapple with what does resurrection mean back then and yes right now in our lives what does resurrection mean for us because jesus became one of us and experienced life and death and new life then we have a way of being in relationship with god that is easier more direct and available to us through the generosity of god rather than our goodness and effort god and jesus became one of us at christmas and became a new and living way for us to return to god at easter what is resurrection resurrection is renewal resurrection is restoration resurrection is recreation as paul reminded us anyone in christ is a new creation the old is gone the new has come life death and new life and jesus was suggesting that is the same in spiritual life the big pattern of our particular birth our long life our physical death and our continuous eternal life and it is also true in the thousands of small deaths and renewals we must go through to grow into our true selves resurrection means transformation giving ourselves over to the annual weekly seasonal patterns of life death and renewal as we grow into the people god would have us to be we become a resurrection people a people of rejoicing a people of hope a people of journey and becoming so let us rejoice in the enormity of the gift this day the day of resurrection and let us receive the gift of resurrection into ourselves day by day growing in our desire and capacity to see the invitation to new life in the many forms it takes in the bread and wine of communion the new generations of our families and neighbors the seasons of rain and regrowth and rest that revives and reimagines life let us proclaim hope in the situations we find ourselves in and to the world of which we are a part this is not always easy given the very real struggle and suffering that most of us experience at one time or another and that some experience most of the time let us be a people of compassion and integrity in the world as it is and a people who make real the hope of the kingdom of god on earth as the world as it could as it should be you know we knew the ending before our latin journey even began we know this epic love story but we cannot stop at its familiarity we open ourselves up to the unexpected as we arrive at the tomb and realize we have to lay our own spices down letting go of what we know how to do to step towards whatever is next do not be daunted by the symbols and signs of death do not be overwhelmed by what is or what you hope will be loosen your grasp from what captivates and distracts look for the living live he is risen
So no matter how you feel today, whether you're running to get here, whether you're desperate and hungry for a spiritual experience, or whether you're unsure and moving slowly, know there is room for you here. The table is an expansive table. There is food for everyone. There is a seat for everyone. There is love for everyone. There is no scarcity here because this is God's table and all are welcome. We begin our thanksgiving as we prepare to receive Holy Communion. God of the garden, God of new life, God of the here and now, where do we begin? Our hearts are full to the brim with gratitude, hope, fear, doubt, dreams, and belief. As a result, our prayers can often feel chaotic at best, bouncing around to each name and need that comes to mind. Settle us. Summon out what we shall be. Lift our prayers from the rubble of distracted minds and hold us close. God, there are some things we would like to let go of, things we'd like to bury, things we do not to bring with us into this new day. In particular, we'd like to let go of our stress and fatigue. We'd like to let go of our own self-criticism and low self-esteem. We'd like to let go of the fear to put ourselves out there and the worry that we might not have enough or be enough. Things are always easier said than done, God, which is why we need you. At the same time, there are things we'd like to hold close, things that draw us closer to that expansive life you dream of, things we are running toward. In particular, we want to move closer to balance and to meaningful relationships, to health of mind, body, and spirit, to justice that sets our hearts on fire, and to your word lived out in our daily lives. Help us. Guide the way. Meet us in the garden. Roll back the stones that stop us. Give us the energy to run toward you. Gather us up in your expansive love until the promised day when swords are beaten to plowshares and the prayers of the people are only prayers of joy. We ask that you pour out your spirit on this bread and cup so that we might catch a glimpse of you here at the table. Gather us up in your expansive love. Until that promised day, we continue to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Today we gather to remember, today we gather to celebrate. And we do remember that he gathered in that room with the disciples in that holy week, took bread, broke bread, shared it with those gathered with him, saying, this is my body, which will be given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper had ended and the time was growing short, he took the cup, raised the cup, asked his father's blessing upon it, then shared it with those gathered with him at the table, saying, This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which will be shed for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this also in remembrance of me. I invite you to take out your communion set and please open the bread side. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Lord, today we gather in celebration of a miracle. A miracle promised and a miracle received. 
and the gathering the knowledge that you are alive and fully present in our lives. We thank you for the gift of Holy Communion, another reminder of your deep love and presence. In your name we pray. Amen. So we are invited to look for the living. Relationships and efforts that lead to the thriving in our spirit, our bodies, and our communities. Let the waters seed of solidarity tend the soul of creativity. And relish the blooming of healing. As the body of the risen Christ, we collect our offerings for the love we want to grow and offer once again ourselves as we sing the doxology. Of the resurrection, 
I invite you to stand and sing together our glory, love, and honor. Thank you. 